big notation, I got 1.58489319 times 10 to the negative fourth. In expanded form, I got 0 0.0001584891. Those are the exact same numbers. Everybody sees that from the exponent side perspective. They're exactly the same. If it's concentration, it's the capital M for molar. Remember to go from this one to this one or back and forth. You can do the second in the number four, puts it in normal decimal format. The second in number five puts it in scientific notation. So remember that the second button in number four, the second button in number five, those are the ones that you can use to flip back and forth from the decimal place format to scientific notation. But I still can't keep all those decimal places no matter which one you use. So how many decimal places do I need? Three, three right? So 3.080, three decimal places in the pH. So that means the 158. 158, irregardless of which one you use. The next number is a 4, so those just round off. So my number would end up being 1.58 times 10 to the minus 4th, or 0 0.000158. They're both the same. So then the last one, if an HCl solution has a pH of 6.34, what is its concentration? So 6.34, same thing. I'm going to put 6.34 in, make it negative. So that's the plus minus button is that little plus minus symbol. And then I hit the second button and then log to get the inverse log of a negative 6.34. This one 0 0.1234564567, that's molar. Or if I put it in scientific notation, it looks like 4.57088189 times 10 to the minus 7. So both of those are exactly the same. Okay. One's just in scientific notation, the other one's in the normal expanded form. And so you can flip back and forth three decimal places, or not three decimal places, three significant figures with this because 6.34 has three significant figures. So that 457, 457, those are the three significant figures I'd keep. Next number is a zero, so those would all round off. So all of this would end up getting dropped. So this would be 4.57 times 10 to the minus seventh molar. Remember that you do keep the exponent number. So just remember, if you see that in your little, in the calculator, the two little numbers at the very far end, remember that that's telling what you, what your exponent number is. What is what? E oh, English. I think it puts it in, if you hit second English, it puts this one, this one into three, puts 457 times 10 to the minus ninth. I mean, I would never use that. So that's why um, second flow puts it in normal, no exponents at all. Second and five is scientific. So those are really the two that you're going to want to use. So these are really the two to remember. If you want to flip back and forth from scientific notation to normal expanded form. Okay. So you should be able to go ahead and finish up chapter nine. There is an acids and base um, dynamic study module, I think, that you had to do was one of the assignments that were due in this. Then what we were doing is we went on into chapter 10. I did a little altering again, trying to make them a little bit shorter. So we were talking first about the building blocks of proteins, which are the amino acids. So characteristics of amino acids, so just remember there's always a nitrogen right? That's the amino name. And then there's always that carbon with the two oxygens on the opposite side of the amino acid. That's the acid side. The way that they differ, so remember that you see that all of them have this nitrogen on one side, the carboxylate or carboxylic acid group on the other side. It's that middle carbon that can be chiral. And that middle carbon has that R group, 
which just means it's a the that is the part of the amino acid that makes one amino acid different from another. Is this R group? They sometimes refer to it as the side chain or the residue. That R group is what makes the different amino acids different from one another. And so we can split the R groups up into the six nonpolar, well, there's actually nine, right? There's nine nonpolar amino acids. So remember there, the R group is either like just hydrogen or just um, carbon and hydrogen. It's gonna have the typical nonpolar characteristic. You do not have to know the names of them. You do not have to be able to draw any of them. Okay, but just looking at the purple colored boxed areas, those, these six, they're nonpolar because if you look at them, you see they're nothing but carbons and hydrogen in the purple area. So they say they're a nonpolar R group, which means remember that they're hydrophobic. So they don't want to mix with water. Same thing with these three. So these three, now tryptophan does have a nitrogen, but in comparison, that one that's got kind of a bigger purple box, it does have a nitrogen, but it also has an aromatic group. It also has more carbons on it. So comparatively, the nitrogen is not gonna have as much of an effect because there's so many more carbons that are there. Then we talked about the six that are polar. They have oxygen, they have nitrogen, so they are hydrophilic. If you see nitrogen and oxygen and not a really big molecule, those ones are hydrophilic. And then the last ones, these four or five, no, the five, the ones that go in here, so these six are polar and then these seven, eight, so there's really eight that are polar. But these bottom ones that are here, these bottom ones, oh no, I'm sorry, all of these ones actually have a charge. So these five, they're considered charged. Sometimes they call them acidic or basic because remember that acidic means they're a proton donor. Basic means they're a proton acceptor. So that's really all it's telling you is that the thing to look for with this group is that in that purple box, you can see that there is a charge So see on that, see that oxygen with the negative charge? If I slide over, you can see the same thing. You can see that oxygen has a negative charge. I can't make it do the other thing. It goes back, okay? Looking down at like lysine, histidine, arginine, these ones are nitrogens that have that charge. So you can see the nitrogen not well because I can't figure out, how, oh, there it goes there. So now you can see a little bit brighter. So you can see that nitrogen. There's two nitrogens in this ring and it's got a positive charge. So just remember if you see, if you see an R group, not the nitrogen carbon carbon backbone that they all have, that beige box, all of them have that. But it's the purple section. If the purple section has a positive or negative charge, then you know it's going to be hydrophilic as well. So that would be another hydrophilic amino acid. Or if you see amino acids that have nitrogens and oxygens and they're not really big, like this. So like, see, there's an alcohol on serine. Tyrosine has an alcohol, asparagine has a nitrogen and an oxygen. So if you see nitrogen and oxygen in the R group setting, then that's gonna make something that's hydrophilic. So you know then that things that are hydrophilic are gonna wanna interact with water interact with each other. Things that are hydrophobic are not going to interact with water. And that ends up affecting how the shape of the protein ends up having. Okay. So we kind of quit here. So I said that there's 20 amino acids. They all differ by those R groups. You, as an adult, you can make 12 of them. So you can actually make amino acids from other amino acids. You can make amino acids from fat. You can make amino acids from even glucose. But six of them, you can't make. So they call those the essential amino acids. That means that you just have to have it in your diet. Children, infants, they actually have 10 amino acids that are essential. But as you grow and develop, you can actually make those other two. So you typically get these from any kind of meat, right? So those essential amino acids, you can get all eight essential from meat. So that's chicken, pork, beef, <laughs> eggs, milk, fish, any kind of animal product. That's why they call those complete proteins. 
A complete protein just means that it has all the amino acids that you that are considered essential. But if you don't eat any animal products, you can still get a complete protein, but you have to combine both grain and beans. Okay, so legumes as well as grain. So the whole beans and rice, peanut butter and jelly, all examples of where you're getting two different grain or plant sources. Each of them has some of the essential amino acids and together you get all of them. Okay. So you'll see when talking about amino acids, most of the time they like to like use an abbreviation rather than talking about cysteine, methionine, arginine, valine, glycine. They use like a three letter code. So that's, and you don't have to memorize these ones. I'm just telling you that you'll see them oftentimes written with this abbreviation. So you don't see the whole name written. You'll just see three letters. In fact, there are even one letter codes that you can use just know that amino acids are sometimes written out that way. So don't let that kind of like throw you. Like if you see GLY, if you see those three letters, any kind of three letter grouping, most of the time they're actually referring to amino acids. It's just a short abbreviated form because some of the names like phenylalanine, tryptophan, methionine, some of them are kind of long names. And so this just helps sort of shorten them. Okay, so I just found this list and put it in because I was like, oh, you don't have to memorize the names and the, the three letter codes. That would be a little bit beyond this class. But I just wanted to point out that that's actually how they're commonly written. So now we get into protein structure. So we've talked about the building blocks. So these building blocks are put together, linked into polymers using a condensation reaction. So you remember we talked about condensation reactions way back in chapter five. Condensation reactions, this is just like how you form the glycosidic bond. Hydrogen is pulled off of one molecule, alcohol off of the other molecule. H and OH combine, and that way you form water, okay? So that first example, that one actually shows how like triglycerides are built by linking the fatty acids to a glycerol molecule. The second one is showing how you can have proteins linking together. The peptide bond is the type of bond. The third one is showing like how glycosidic bonds are linked together. So this is really the common type of reaction that links monomers, individual units into a chain. So you have lots and lots of these condensation reactions to be able to link things and form bigger molecules. So the one we're gonna talk about is this one, is this peptide bond. And so in forming the peptide bond, the side of that nitrogen carbon carbon, that part of what we call the backbone of the amino acid, the part that's exactly the same in all amino acids, the carbon with the double bond, the two oxygens, links to the nitrogen of the next amino acid. And in doing so, an oxygen is pulled off of that carbon, two hydrogens are pulled off of the nitrogen, and it forms water. So the red ones that they have highlighted, so the two H's and this O, H2O, so the two H's from the hydrogen, the one oxygen from the carbon get linked together, forming water, and in doing so, that's going to form the bond between the carbon and the nitrogen of the next amino acid. That link is actually in amide. If you look at it, can you see that it's a nitrogen connected to a carbon with a double bond oxygen? Do you see that that's actually an amide? If you remember the functional groups, so that's an amide, but they call it a peptide bond because it's two amino acids linking together. And notice in this one, so they say alanine and valine, so they're just showing these two amino acids. And then they'll be written together where it's ALA-VAL, showing that those are linked together by that peptide bond.
So nitrogen and nitrogens never combine when you make a peptide bond. It's always the carbon side of one amino acid linking to the nitrogen side of the next amino acid. So it's constantly going to be nitrogen, carbon, carbon, linked to a nitrogen, carbon, carbon, linked to a nitrogen, carbon, carbon. And that's how you'll end up forming the chain. So I thought, well, let's do one. Okay. And we'll just say, okay, these are four amino acids. Here is amino acid number one, here's amino acid number two, amino acid three, and amino acid four. I didn't give them a specific name, I just put R. So that's just like the generic R group, the group that's different between the two. But if you look, you can see that other than that, they're exactly the same. Each nitrogen has three hydrogens. The carbon in the middle has a hydrogen sticking up in an R, hanging down. The carbon on the right has a double bond oxygen and an oxygen with a negative bond or negative charge. So those are, that part is all like exactly the same. The only really way that they differ is just by those R groups. So in doing this link on this end, it's still the same. So this nitrogen on this end's got a positive charge. It's linked to two carbons. The first carbon, Nothing happens, it doesn't change at all. It has a hydrogen sticking up in that R1 group hanging down. But now the second one, the second one, the double bond oxygen stays, but it loses its oxygen. And that forms the link to the nitrogen on the second amino acid. The nitrogen on the second amino acid loses two hydrogens, because see how it has three to begin with. It's going to lose two hydrogens, and that is going to form our water. So then I go to the middle carbon, which never is affected, so it's still H and an R2. But now I'm to the third, the, the second carbon on that amino acid. It loses its oxygen and forms a link to the nitrogen of amino acid number three. Amino acid, the nitrogen on amino acid three loses its two hydrogens. So this is going to form a water. And then hydrogen up and R3 sticking down off that middle carbon. The right carbon on amino acid number three keeps its double bond to oxygen, but it loses its other oxygen to form water. And that forms the bond between carbon, uh, amino acid three and amino acid four. And then this last one, we have R4, that middle carbon, no change at all. And the end carboxylate or carboxylic acid group, that doesn't change because it's not linked to anything. So now we have four amino acids linked together. Each one of these bonds here, 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 those are the peptide bonds, right? So those are the links between the amino acid that starts this chain. So remember I said some amino acids, some proteins are small. They have 40, 50 amino acids. Some proteins are huge and they can have like hundreds, kind of like starch, not quite as big as starch, but they can have long chains of amino acids. They call this the primary structure. The primary structure is just the order of the amino acids linked by peptide bonds. Mm -hmm. Right, well, this, what we just built is the primary structure. It's just amino acid one linked to amino acid two, linked to amino acid three, linked to amino acid four. So the actual order of the amino acids is called its primary structure. So you would think then proteins would look just like a string, right? Because this just looks like a polymer, like, like beads on a chain. So it looks like it would be just a string, but now we come into, oh, well, I guess we could talk about this. So have you ever heard of celiac disease? So some people say that they have, glu um, that they have gluten intolerance. That's kind of like was a big buzz word for quite a few years. It's sort of like leveling out again. Celiac disease is when you actually are allergic 
to the proteins that are found in gluten. Gluten is a protein that's found in grain. So gluten is found in wheat. Gluten is found in like barley. Gluten is found in like rye. It's all the seed forms. There is no gluten in rice. There is no gluten in oats. But a lot of people have a hard time eating oats because it's oftentimes processed on machinery that also processes wheat. So it may have very small residual amounts of wheat powder, like, you know, like when they, because, you know, you get wheat, like the, they harvest, and then you have to separate like the, the chaff from the actual grain. And then if they take the seed coat off, you know, like the bran off, that's a whole nother step. So there's a lot of machinery that's involved in actually preparing wheat just to become flour. And so they use similar machinery to process oats because it's about the same size. They all grow like on a little stalk. So some people can't have, they just stay away from oats unless they can get gluten-free oats. But the problem is, is the structure, when gluten is digested, you get little fragments of this protein. Fragments kind of like that, like four, 10, 15 amino acid chains. Those fragments are seen as foreign by somebody that has celiac disease. So literally what will happen is their immune system will begin to attack the surface of the small intestine, thinking that those gluten proteins are actually foreign substances like bacteria or virus, something that is not supposed to be there, your immune system attacks it. That causes the small intestine lining to swell and that decreases absorption. It can long-term cause actual damage to the small intestine. People that have truly have celiac disease, if they eat things that contain gluten, they will have bouts of, like, it's the irritable bowel, but to an extreme because they have pain, gas, bloating, nausea. They also have decreased absorption. So what they do eat, they're not absorbing. So if a friend that has celiac disease, and if he was eating gluten, even small amounts, like I'd see him and he'd get smaller and smaller and smaller. He looked like skeletal at one point. And so it was just, he had to figure out what was, there was still gluten in some, some of the cereals he was eating, something that was triggering this response. So this, I think, is a really good picture that you can see is... When you look at that picture, the, the little, the little like illustration, the lining of your small intestine has these like finger-like extensions called villi. And what those do is it increases the surface area of your small intestine. Food and nutrients kind of go down into those little fingers and they hit the wall of the small intestine and then they get absorbed. Someone with celiac disease, because of the inflammation, those fingers disappear. So you can see how flat that surface looks. So that means now nutrients pass by and they don't run into the wall. So that means they're not gonna get absorbed. So that is how you can end up with malabsorption and issues. They have to go on auto, like immunosuppressants to try and get the small intestine under control to cut down on the inflammation. And they have to be like really pretty rigid about not eating or drinking anything that is any kind of wheat byproduct in it that has any kind of other grain other than strictly rice and oats. And that's pretty much it. Because there's gluten in all other types of those flours. Corn's okay. Corn's like, it's really more of a starchy vegetable, but doesn't contain the same protein, the same gluten protein that you find in the wheat forms. So there, it's just the chain. It's just short little chains of this protein is what triggers this reaction. So you would think though, that these, these chains of proteins would just be like a string. But in fact, remember that there are polar and nonpolar interactions that go in, come into play. So one type of interaction that occurs creates what they call secondary structure. So primary structure is just the order of the amino acids. But secondary structure, this is the part of the chain. Remember that it's nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon. 
So remember that each of these nitrogens has a hydrogen. So every one of the nitrogens has a hydrogen and those non-bonding electrons. The carbon has a double bond oxygen. So the right carbon has a double bond oxygen. This sets up the stage to allow for hydrogen bonding. So remember I told you hydrogen bonding happens if you have nitrogen or an oxygen and one of them has a hydrogen, they will want to share. So I'll try and pull it up. Can you see it there? So can you see the carbon with the double bond oxygen and then a little dot, dot, dot to the nitrogen that has its hydrogen? So they are creating these interactions along the chain and that, that hydrogen bonding keeps the chain from just being straight Instead, there's two ways it can change shape. This is what they call a helix. So can you see that it looks like a helix? So it looks like a twist. So they call it an alpha helix. That alpha helix having this arrangement actually makes the protein more flexible and stronger because you can take this and pull it and it bounces back. If it was a straight, if it was just a string, it would be like a piece of spaghetti. If you pulled on it, it would snap. But what this allows the protein to do is it gives it a lot more flexibility and makes it stronger. It can stretch and recoil. So it can handle some bending. It can handle some pulling without actually having the issue of it like snapping. And it's really the chain creates this. So it's not the R groups, it's actually what they call the backbone, which is the nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon chain that gets linked together in that primary structure. So that's one, it's the alpha helix. The second one is called, they call it a pleated sheet. So this one, do you see how this looks like you took a piece of paper and you like folded it forward, folded it back, folded it forward, folded it back. And so what that creates is more like, did you ever make a fan like this when you were a kid, right? So you make this out of a piece of paper. Now you can sit there, but that again, gives you this flexibility. So if the paper was just flat, you couldn't pull on it, but having this kind of folded appearance gives it this flexibility and allows it to be able to be stretched without breaking. It helps to maintain this sort of basic shape. Increasing flexibility. It's not as rigid. So the protein is not as rigid and stiff. It has the ability to sort of like fold back and forth without causing damage, without snapping the chain. So an example of this is secondary structure changes in the brain are what you see with Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is a specific type of dementia. So it means that like you begin to lose memories, you begin to learn, lose like the ability to recognize certain things. Eventually you begin to learn, you lose the ability to do the normal activities that you used to do, everything from eating to walking to being like potty trained, all the things they always say, people with Alzheimer's kind of like, they can start regressing. So you start to see them kind of going back further and further, acting more and more childlike as time goes on. So the reason for this is people that have Alzheimer's, they have a protein, there's a protein in the brain called beta amyloid. People that have, that don't have Alzheimer's, this protein has an alpha helix. People with Alzheimer's, this protein develops with pleated sheet strands. When they have that pleated sheet strand, that actually makes them sticky. So they tend to cling together. They form clumps inside of the nerve cells and ultimately that causes the nerve cell to die. So they call it plaque because it's like these sort of like solid clumps that are found in the neurons. But it's really just because of the wrong shape. 
so you can kind of see the difference. So normal, see the alpha helix? So it looks to me like alpha helix reminds me of curling ribbon, okay? That kind of natural curl that it gets. So people that don't have Alzheimer's, this protein inside of the nerve cells has this shape. But they have found that people that develop Alzheimer's, this protein changes shape, forming, see the pleated sheets, see how they like fold back and forth, back and forth. They form the pleated sheets and the pleated sheets actually create these clumps that create those tangles, plaque, loss of nerve impulses. And so what happens is you have fewer and fewer nerve impulses. So you lose memory, you lose normal processing, ability to recall information, and even more of the loss of normal routine things that you had done all along because it's a change, a change that occurs in secondary structure. But this is actually not the only kind of folding that a protein has. Some proteins have what's called tertiary structure. So this is like another layer of structure. Tertiary structure is because of those R groups. So this is why I pointed those out. So when you're talking about R groups, if you have nonpolar R groups, are they gonna wanna be interacting with water? Nonpolar is like hydrophobic, right? Nonpolar is oil-like. So the nonpolar R groups, they are going to want to cluster together and they don't want to be around water. So that if you have if you have a protein and there are some regions on that protein that are hydrophobic, so maybe a different color. So if this area and this area, really, this area, this area, this area, if these are hydrophobic, that is going to cause a change in the folding of the molecule so that those areas are gonna all end up kind of like together, kind of like the micelle. Remember how with the micelle, all those nonpolar tails like went to the inside? So the same thing happens. So these three areas will all end up kind of clumped together and the rest of it will end up being like this. So those nonpolar regions like, like to bury themselves in the middle and that ends up changing the overall shape. It can still have some alpha helix. It may still have beta pleated sheet regions, but you can see a change. Whereas polar groups, salt bridges, these are all hydrophilic. So they like to be like towards the outside. So polar amino acids can interact with water. Polar amino acids can interact with each other. Those charge, the positive and negative amino acids, they actually attract like ionic um, interactions. So they're really strongly attracted. They form even, they call them a bridge because they can actually form a pretty tight link. There's two amino acids that contain sulfur. So there's methionine and cysteine. Those two amino acids can actually form what they call a sulfur bridge where there are two sulfurs end up forming a covalent bond. And that acts again, like a really tight attachment. So if you look, you can kind of see them all on this one. I like this picture. Can you see alpha helix in this? Can you see coil? You see the coil? Do you see any beta pleated sheets? Do you see where it looks like it's folded back on itself? Like down near that bottom? how it kind of comes and comes back around. So this area, this would be a beta pleated sheet. There's those alpha helixes. So you can still have secondary structure, but now notice here, here we have the hydrophobic R groups. So notice nothing but carbons and hydrogen. So there's an aromatic group in there. There's a methyl group in there. So those are not gonna wanna interact with water. So they all kind of group together. There's a salt bridge right here that you can see, so this salt bridge, so one amino acid with the positive charge is attracted to another amino acid with the negative charge, so that's like sodium chloride, so that's gonna create a strong attraction and help to hold it together. Polar hydropho hydrophilic amino acids, they can interact with water, they can also interact with each other, like what we have here. So this now takes this chain that may have had some, some coils, 
It may have had some switchback kind of folding, but now it's going to cause certain parts of the protein are going to like twist and torque. And that's how you end up with this. <laughs> they call an, a protein that with a lot of folding, they call it globular because it looks like a glob. Can you like see that? Okay, so instead of it just being laying flat, it has a very folded shape. If it has a lot of tertiary structure, that's what you're going to see. So remember that how I drew the enzymes? How I drew them looking kind of like a letter E laying down kind of with the little squigglies to form the shape? That shape is formed because of this tertiary structure. And that shape can be very important to the functioning of the protein. Lots of tertiary structure typically causes or creates a globular shape. Mm -hmm. See like the hydrophobic ones? See right here? So see how there's nothing but carbons and aromatic groups in there? So those are like oil. So they don't want to interact with the polar hydrophilic stuff. So they like group together, kind of like the micelle, how those tails all cluster together. So that can cause, that causes that whole side to kind of curl around. Okay. And that's how you end up with these shapes because you have things that are groups that are polar, are groups that are charged, they interact, but nonpolar groups are not going to want to interact. And that's going to create this sort of twisted, folded, globular appearance. So there's one of their examples. So globular proteins, they create this kind of shape. They tend to be more spherical, right? More three-dimensional. Enzymes are good examples of globular proteins. Hemoglobin, the protein that carries oxygen in your red blood cell, good example of a globular protein. There's also fibrous proteins. And fibrous proteins, just like they sound, look kind of stringy. They don't have this big folded three-dimensional rounded appearance. They look more like strings. Fibrous proteins don't have as much tertiary structure, but their function typically is not as an enzyme their shape is not as important. What they act as, they act like anchors. So they act as like ropes. So they help to hold structures together. In fact, the most common protein, the most abundant protein found in the body is drawn right here down at this bottom. I don't know if it'll let me blow it up. I'll try. Is here. It's collagen. So collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. Collagen is what makes your bones. Collagen is what makes your all your cartilage. Collagen is what makes all your tendons and ligaments. All of the anchoring, like the reason that when you pull on your skin, that part underneath the surface, the dermis, all got all that has fibrous collagen protein. And then if you look at it, do you see how it looked kind of stringy? Like when you look at it, it looks very stringy in its appearance. That is because it's really just a big anchor. So that's really its job is it anchors this thing to this thing. It helps to hold this to this, this to this. Sometimes it's wrapped in many multiple um, proteins to form a really thick piece, kind of like a ligament or a tendon. So not all proteins have a lot, a lot of folding. Some of them have less tertiary structure, but those ones tend to be more anchoring, more structural in their job. They're really pretty strong and durable. Like your, your bones and your tendons and ligaments are really designed to last your whole life. They do get repaired slowly, but they're really designed to be sort of like reinforcing strong structures. So you tell me, looking at this, and I really need to like change the color of that thing. But looking at this, would this be, is this a polar or a non-polar? I guess hydrophilic or hydrophobic is a better term. Would you say that this one's hydrophilic or hydrophobic? There's amino acid one right here. Looking at that R group. 
Mm -hmm. So this one's hydrophilic because it's got oxygen and it's got a charge. So I'll just write philic from now on. Then looking at amino acid number two, what would you say? Hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophobic. Uh -huh. Another hydrophilic. See, there's three nitrogens. One of them has a charge on that end. So now we'll go on to amino acid number three. Hmm? That one's hydrophobic. Do you notice nothing but carbon, 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 hydrogen? Okay, so this one is going to be hydrophobic. What about this one? It's really that blue part. You're looking at the R group. So this one, it's got that OH on the end, so it can interact or participate with what water is doing. So it would, it's not very hydrophilic, it's not very hydrophobic, but it would be more hydrophilic than phobic. What about the next one? Ooh. Yep, mm -hmm. so no, it's nothing but four carbons with hydrogens. So this one's going to be hydrophobic. The next one. Mm -hmm. That one's going to be hydrophilic. Two nitrogens, one of them has a charge on it. Now this one's an odd one. That is proline. That is actually an amino acid. See how it's R group? The R group actually goes from the carbon onto its nitrogen. So it just forms like this little, little pentagon shape. But these, remember, are nothing but carbon, carbon, carbon. So what would that be? Like a CH2, CH2, CH2. So that would be hydrophobic. Mm -hmm. And then the last one. Hydrophobic as well, mm -hmm. because it's nothing but an aromatic with a carbon. So remember that that six-membered ring with that funny circle is an aromatic group. So those would be hydrophobic. So any of those hydrophobic ones, they would all be tucked together. They would all want to kind of cluster around each other. The hydrophilic can interact with water, interact with each other. They tend to be more on the outside. Hydrophobic tends to be more on the inside of a protein. Last level. Primary structure is just the order of the amino acids. Secondary structure is the coiling that you find of the backbone, making the helix and the pleated sheet. Tertiary is that R group, polar, nonpolar, hydrophilic, hydrophobic folding that occurs. But some proteins have more than one chain of amino acids. So that is what they call quaternary structure. Not all proteins have this. This is only if you have two or more chains that have come together and form a larger protein. I always think of them as they make a complex. Not all proteins have this, but some proteins actually have multiple protein chains that make them up. In fact, collagen, the one that I had on the previous page, it does have this. I can show you it. You can see if I can blow it up. So can you see that collagen? See how it's three? It's actually three strands like woven together. So you can see those. So it's almost like if you look at thread, thread looks just like collagen. Like if you get a piece, you know, like sewing thread, if you look at it real close, you can actually see that it's multiple fibers that are woven together. So collagen is like nature does this. So collagen is actually these woven strands of protein. Keratin's the other one that they show. So that's actually looking at the person's hair. So keratin is what's in your hair, your nails, in the outer layers of your skin. So keratin is a waterproofing protein. Notice that is only two chains coiled together, but those would have quaternary structure. They don't have a lot of tertiary structure because they're not very folded, 
but they would still be considered having quaternary structure because they have multiple, co multiple chains that are all wrapped together. I was like, and now it's not gonna go back, but then it does. So here's one that you can see in this. This is actually hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, hemoglobin is globular and is quadr has quaternary structure. So in this one, the primary structure is just the chain, right? So they'll sometimes draw it looking like the little one with the knot. That's just primary or first degree of structure. Then this one that's here where you can see it looks like it's a coil. That's the secondary structure. So that is that coiling that you can get of the chain. Tertiary structure, they put the little three with the zero. That's when you have this folding because of hydrophilic and hydrophobic. But hemoglobin is actually four proteins. Two of them are purple and two of them are gray. So four proteins come together and form this large complex. That is the quaternary structure. One of these proteins would not carry oxygen very well. They actually need to be fit together. And when they do that, each of those, those proteins changes shape a little bit and has the ability to carry oxygen better than it would if it was separated. Does anybody know what the little red thing is inside? So if you look at this, do you notice that each of these, each of these has like this little red piece. So this is hemoglobin. This makes me so angry. Mm -mm. Hemoglobin, what's in hemoglobin? What is heme? Hmm? So that's a red blood cell. What makes red blood cells red? No, it gets bright red when it's carrying oxygen, dark red when it doesn't have oxygen. But what is it that's in this protein that's what makes a red blood cell red? Sometimes you can't, you can't RNA. donate because it's not RNA, it's mm -mm, what's inside. Sometimes you can't give blood because this level's too low. Yep, that's what those little red things are, okay? So that is what they call the heme, and the heme is an iron atom that is actually like held right in the middle of each of those that iron atom is what binds oxygen. So like the heme, the hemoglobin actually like holds that iron atom in place. That's where the oxygen gets attracted to. So hemoglobin is one that has all of those characteristics, not just the chain, not just the coils, not just the big folding, but even has multiple chains coming together to form a really big complex. These kinds of amino acid, or sorry, these kinds of proteins, the ones that are really folded, they have issues because if you take and shake them, or if you add acid to them, or if you add toxins to them, if you heat them, you can take these really folded proteins and cause them to denature. So we actually did this in lab when we were doing the protein, um, the enzyme activity. So we took lactase, the enzyme, and we did, we tested the ability of the enzyme to break down lactose at different temperatures. And one of the temperatures was like zero degrees, one was room temperature, one was 37, but one was boiling, right? So remember that one we had, we put it in boiling water, about 90 degree water, and left it there the whole time. And I don't know if you remember, but the activity of that enzyme was zero all the way across. And that's because heating. So heating enzymes causes that folding to be lost and it causes it to denature. So their image that they show, see how it looks like a string of spaghetti? It doesn't have its fold anymore. When you fry an egg, you take the globular egg white, which is lots of protein, it gets heated and it actually then unfolds and becomes solid. So that's why egg whites that have been boiled or fried, they turn white and solid, is because of that heat. So heating, shaking, has anybody ever made whipping whipped cream? Okay, so whipped cream, or even if you've ever um, taken egg whites and beat them in order to make meringue, because it's all this protein. 
So you're vigorously beating these big globular proteins and it causes them to denature, causes them to lose their shape. And that's why it goes from being the gooey egg white to being the fluffy white meringue. It's all because of mechanically sort of beating or whipping those proteins. Adding acid or base. Has anybody ever um, had their milk go bad? Where it's like, have you ever poured it and it's like chunks? <laughs> <laughs> that happens when it goes past date because bacteria begin to grow in the milk and they make acid. And those acids cause the proteins in the milk to become solid. So like that used to always happen. We'd go off on vacation and then come back two weeks later. And it was first thing was like, just throw the milk in the trash. Don't even open it because you open it and you're like, oh, it's all sour smelling. Okay. That's just because there were microbes in the milk. And once it goes past a certain date, then they know that the number of microbes growing in there, even in the refrigerator, is high enough to actually cause it to begin to separate. Some people do this on purpose. If you make like um, cake or biscuits, you use buttermilk. Okay, so buttermilk has more acid in it, and that can actually get your causes your it's the acid in it causes the baking soda in your self-rising flour to to release more gas, causes them to be fluffier than if you just use regular milk. I like gave up long ago trying to make biscuits because mine were always like hockey pucks. Okay, this just doesn't work. I don't know why, I just am not made for that. The other one, another example is heavy metals. So heavy metals like lead, mercury, um, they found that people that worked in industry where they were doing stuff like, like putting metal plating on in instruments or even on cars, you know how like they used to have big chrome bumpers on things. So you actually have to take and plate that, which means that you take a solution and so you're constantly handling zinc and copper and um, what's the other components? Zinc and copper, tin, all of these to be able to create and form these structures, but the men were being coming in contact, people that worked with these were coming in contact with these metals and they began to end up having health issues. They were developing like leukemia, they're de developing health issues because these heavy metals can actually cause damage internally by causing proteins to denature. So lead paint. So they had originally put lead in paint because it helped the, the paint stick to the wall better. So like you wouldn't have to paint very often. So a lot of like exterior, like if you paint anything outside on your house, every three or four years, you got to go back and repaint it because it all starts peeling. It just doesn't stick really good. So adding lead actually really improved how well the paint would stick to the surfaces. The problem comes into play is when that begins to chip or peel, it actually tastes sweet. Lead paint has a slightly sweet taste to it. So little kids come along, here's this little piece of paint sticking out. You p pull it off and what do you do? Stick it in your mouth, because that's what kids do. Like, let's see what this tastes like. And it tastes sweet. So that's why they would actually be sitting there picking the paint, the peeling paint off of the windowsill and eating it. Lead paint, though, the lead actually interferes with normal neurological development. So they found that people that lived in older houses that had been painted over and over and over again with lead-based paint, that they began to see that these kids had developmental delays, they had learning difficulties, behavioral issues, and it all was traced back to this. So now, if you buy a house now, you actually have to get a, a like, they have to tell you if this house ever has had lead paint in it. it. It depends on the age. Past 1950, I think they like banned it. So they are, there was no more lead paint sold prior to that. And that's all because of this. So that's why your, lead, your paint doesn't stick as well to the, to the walls like it used to. But it also went back to try and help this. But, you know, there's a lot of people that live in houses that are up close to 100 years old. And so those houses almost definitely had lead-based paint. I had a friend in Nashville that they had like, they, they tested her kids and her kids showed up higher than normal. Like there was not zero. It wasn't like dangerously high, but it was higher than normal. So she actually had a company that had to come in 
Like they had to leave. They had to like dust proof and drop cloth everything and like scrape to get as much off as possible. What they couldn't get, they actually went and used primer to like seal to try and seal it so that it would not, it wouldn't end up coming off anymore so that the kids wouldn't come in contact with it. Then afterwards they had to go and like clean all around the outside where all of the, all the lead based paint, like where the removal had happened. It was a huge, big, like drawn out process to try and uh, to change that. And then over time they just kept testing their, her kids and the levels were coming down. They were better, but it's all because of that. Just because living in the old house, she had just small amounts of peeling paint and kids go play outside, dig in the dirt and everything. And so there's like, there's lead in the ground because that's where that paint had accumulated over generations. So things like shaking, heating, adding acid or base, heavy metals, all of those things can actually cause proteins to denature and affect the ability. Primarily, these are globular proteins. Fibrous proteins are not as affected. They're a little bit hardier, but it is pretty much globular proteins that are the most affected by these things, and it can cause them to denature, lose their shape. So there's just examples, right? So denature just means it unfolds, and that's why globular proteins have a lot of folding, so denaturation really affects them more than, a, um, than fibrous proteins. Okay, so those are the, the really the structure aspects of proteins. So now we're just gonna apply and think about, okay, well, what do proteins do? So proteins in your body, their primary job is not as a nutrient or energy source. Instead, you really use proteins that you ingest, you digest them completely, you absorb the amino acids, and you use these amino acids to build proteins that the body needs. So here's the eight functions. And in fact, they're kind of grouped together. So I have like the first three that are grouped together, and then I have the next two that are grouped together. And then the last one we'll talk about enzymes a little, not very much, because we already talked about them quite a bit. But in this, the first three are on this one slide. Proteins can be messengers, like hormones. So messengers, send a stimulus from one part of the body to another. Hormones travel through the blood, circulate through the blood. They go from one, from the one part of the body, whatever gland they get secreted from, and they end up affecting another cell some distance from them. Like think of insulin. Insulin is secreted by your pancreas and insulin then is going to bind to receptors. The receptor is the protein that's on the surface of the cell that your messenger interacts with. They're both proteins and shape here is really important. The shape of your messenger and the shape of your receptor have to be equal. They have to be complementary for them to work. With insulin, once insulin binds to an insulin receptor on your body cells, that opens a channel and the channel is another protein. So those are called the transporters or channels. Those are in the cell membrane, and those allow things to move in and out of the cell. So remember looking at this, right? So we looked at this back in, now I'm trying to remember, I guess chapter eight, right? So the Yellow is the insulin, that's a protein. The green is the insulin receptor, that's a protein. Then you've got, whoops, stay, no. <laughs> I was like, oh, look, no. <laughs> so you can see in this one, so the yellow is the, is the insulin, it's a protein. The green is the receptor, that's a protein. But then that blue channel, that, is what opens and lets glucose go into the cell. So all three of those are proteins and all three of those work together to get glucose to go outside of the cell and flow in. Okay, so think like insulin hormones or insulin messengers, insulin receptors, and then glucose channels. Three examples of protein function 
And that's just for glucose. Like you have channels for water, for salts, for other nutrients. So there's lots of them. The fourth one, the fourth one is a carrier. And here, hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a good example of a carrier. Hemoglobin's job is to carry oxygen. So remember I said in this one, the image that they did is, if you look at this, see the green? So in this one, they did it green with a kind of yellow center to it. That's the heme or the iron is that very center. So those, the red ribbony are the two proteins. The blue ribbons are the other two proteins. Cause I said hemoglobin has four proteins total. And then you can see four little green with yellow circles in them. That's the heme or the iron component. So this is when the hemoglobin doesn't have oxygen. And this is when hemoglobin does. So notice the shape change. Now it's not gonna let me, well maybe, okay. Can you see that it's a little different shape? So kind of sit and look at it a minute. Can you see that the shape changes just a little when oxygen binds to hemoglobin? It does have a change in its shape. So the one that's above is when there's no oxygen. So that's like deoxygenated blood. It's darker red in color. The one at the bottom when oxygen is bound, that is the oxygenated or arterial blood. That's that bright red, the bright red blood that you find in an artery. So now, now maybe it'll let me go. <laughs> but it acts like a carrier. No, now it's not. My favorite part. Okay. So hemoglobin, it's a carrier. We talked about another carrier. We talked about HDL and LDL. They carry what? They carry cholesterol. That stands for high density lipoproteins. So these are also protein carriers. Their job though is just to carry fat and cholesterol. But they're another example of a carrier, ones that we've talked about. Five, the fifth one is protection. Their example, and there's actually more than one, but a good example is an antibody. So antibodies, these are made by your white blood cells. Specifically, they're made by lymphocytes, a certain type of white blood cell that's floating in the blood. When the white blood cell is activated, it's activated because it meets something foreign. That white blood cell, and it doesn't always, it doesn't do it always instantly. It might take a little bit of time That's when you're sick. So you like come down with the cold. As soon as you start getting symptoms, your white blood cells are on it. They are trying to look and figure out what virus is it that's causing this. They are trying to figure out exactly what is the shape of this foreign substance. When they figure out the shape, they will make an antibody to that foreign substance. And so if you have a foreign virus or cell, the antibodies that are made will actually stick to that substance. Whatever the foreign material is, the antibodies are released by the white blood cells and they start to stick to the foreign substance. So there's not just a few, like thousands of antibodies will then start to coat this so most of the time, things that cause infection, they want to be like silent. They want to come into the body, not be detected, be able to take over, create havoc in your body. So what do you think it's going to do if a cell that's infected by a virus has this big glob of antibodies all over the surface? Hmm? Do you think it'd slow them down? Okay, so now it's suddenly got all of these all those antibodies act almost like flags, like, like big arrows going, look, this thing's foreign, okay? It literally marks that substance as being foreign and it calls more white blood cells to the area. 
So it brings those macrophages. So those are the ones that like eat stuff. That's the job of antibodies. Antibodies don't really kill the substance, but they help slow it down and they mark it as foreign. And that attracts more white blood cells to the area so that they can like attack and destroy and get rid of all of it. So that's really the job. And so they always have, I always see antibodies drawn like a Y. I don't know if you've ever seen them. Like whenever anybody draws them, they always look like a little Y. Well, it's the ends, the tops of the Y, the shape of the, those antibodies, the tops are what complement and stick to the foreign substance. So it does take the white blood cell a few minutes, a few days at least, of time to figure out what is the shape of the foreign substance so that it can build antibodies that will actually stick to that foreign substance. So that's protective. Six, contraction. So we move because of two specific proteins that are found in the body. These are found in muscle cells only. Muscle cells make these two proteins called actin and myosin. Actin is the thin one. Myosin is the thick one. 80% of your muscles inside contain these two proteins. If you work out and you build muscle, you just build more of these, okay? If you have like super skinny Bugs Bunny arms, then you don't have a whole lot of these. So it's one or the other, okay? But when people are like getting stronger, it's actually because they just make more of these proteins. They don't make more cells. The proteins can get can build and get more of them, more layers of them, and that muscle cell will get thick, or you can break it all down and the muscle cells will get thin. But what these muscle um, proteins do is when they're stimulated, they pull on one another. So I don't know if you can kind of see the way they initially, that first one, they're not overlapped very much in that first picture, but when the nerve stimulates the muscle, then the overlap increases. So they overlap more, and in doing that, that actually pulls the muscle cell so that it can create this movement. So when muscles are contracted, they're shorter than when they're relaxed, and they shorten because of these proteins, the interaction, this sort of sliding that happens when the muscle contracts and the muscle relaxes, and the muscle contracts, the muscle relaxes. So when people talk about like, oh, I'm trying to like, you know, build muscle, they increase their protein intake because they're actually building lots of actin and myosin proteins. We talked about seven a little bit. So we talked about collagen. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. Collagen looks like a triple, a triple wrapping of fibrous pro proteins. So very much looks like a thread when you look at it in the microscope. Tendons, ligaments, bone, cartilage, all your connective tissues, they all contain collagen. They're just in different arrangements. Like bone is collagen with, with calcium added. Cartilage has kind of like a loose arrangement of collagen so that it's like, you know, like the end of your nose is cartilage and your ears and they're kind of bendy. They're not as hard but it's still collagen. It's just different in how that collagen is arranged. The other one, elastin. So elastin has big folds in it, like big beta pleated sheets. And what elastin does, elastin's in the skin so that you can actually take and stretch. And when you let go, it bounces back. And so I think of it as being more elastic. So elastin's a great name for it. Unfortunately, as you get older, some of these proteins, especially these fibrous proteins, they start to lose some of their shape. And so like elastin, it starts to lose its stretchiness as you get older. And that's why the skin, instead of being pulled tight, it sort of stays a little looser and then it folds and that's what creates wrinkles. So collagen and elastin, good examples of anchoring. And then the last one. So the last one we've talked about, the last one's enzymes. Okay, so I'll leave this one because it's 645. So we'll talk, we've talked about enzymes. So you already know like enzymes lower the activation energy that enzymes help to bring reactants together. We'll just talk a little bit about some inhibitors, some things that affect how well enzymes work. And then that'll finish up chapter 10. So I had somebody that was asking like, okay, well, 